Hey folks, uh, my name is Greg Elkenbard. I'm Senior Technical Director from Mirantis. Uh, I'm here today to uh, present you uh, our efforts in um, accelerating the uh, basic throughput of the VM uh, using Neutron uh, and the SRV pass-through. Uh, we've done it with uh, several different interfaces and during this presentation we'll uh, describe what we did and why. All right, uh, so first of all, uh, let's go through the agenda of the presentation. Uh, uh, I'm going to cover the use cases. Uh, primarily, this is designed to handle um, NFV tr type of traffic, traffic that needs uh, high performance uh, and low latency networks. Uh, I'm going to present you a quick history of the SRV development uh, and why we went ahead and uh, did the work with the um, 82559 chip, um, as well as what are the other options. Uh, some of them are available from the folks on the floor. Some of them Mirantis is uh, working on in concert with folks like Intel. Uh, and I'll give you a brief comparison as to when you should focus on uh, which option. After that, we'll have some time for questions. All right, so uh, first of all, uh, we've been working in the uh, telco NFE sector for a while, uh, and uh, we identified um, that there is uh, roughly two design patterns that people want to deploy. Uh, in the first design pattern, you will have a large backend data center providing mostly OSS, BSS services, uh, and then uh, all of your uh, network-heavy throughput devices get pushed into POPs uh, out there uh, on the edge. So in this, you have relatively small regional clouds. Uh, they're close to the client to remove any uh, residual latency. Um, and uh, the keys to uh, such a cluster um, are efficiency, performance, and cost. Um, the larger backend data center that implements your OSS, BSS, and some of the less network uh, latency sensitive functions uh, will have a larger multi-purpose, uh, typically centralized cloud. Um, and the key to success there is uh, controlling the flexibility um, and the cost. Uh, in addition to the telco NFV use case, uh, there is a lot of NFV needs in the enterprise. Uh, these typically uh, adapt to removing of the traditional uh, network devices and converting them to low footprint, low cost VMs. Uh, things like router as a service, firewall as a service, load balance as a service, um, IDS, application firewall, the typical things that the uh, IT departments need to deploy. Now, the deployment pattern here um, is uh, relatively similar uh, to what you will see in the telco backend case, right? So you'll have a large multipurpose centralized cloud. Um, and the key trade-offs that you need to make are the flexibility of the design and the cost. All right, so SRV uh, has been around in uh, OpenStack. Uh, the work got started originally with the PCI pass-through effort done by multiple companies, uh, but the SRV itself got started around Essex with the changes in Nova and Neutron, um, and pretty much got completed by Icehouse. Uh, it's mostly been focused on uh, getting a NIC pass through without regard uh, to multi-tenancy. Uh, most of the efforts have focused uh, on flat networking environments. Um, however, a uh, few companies, uh, Mellanox in particular, uh, came in and said, well, we can offer intelligent uh, processing um, on our NIC, um, so let's go ahead and introduce SRV uh, with multi-tenant networks. Um, the original driver was introduced uh, in Folsom, uh, got upstreamed in Havana, and integrated with the generic SRV framework um, in Icehouse. Uh, so uh, Mirantis have been uh, working with the driver for a while. We originally deployed it in the Havana timeframe uh, and integrated into our own OpenStack installer called Fuel around the Icehouse. Um, completely unoptimized uh, numbers. Uh, we got 23 gigabits uh, just by bringing up the systems. Um, this was on a completely unoptimized guess. So if you have a DPDK enabled guess, you can get uh, 40 to 80 throughput uh, relatively easily. Uh, now, the problem with the Mellanox is that you needed uh, an extra plug-in NIC that added an extra cost. 
Uh, some of our environments, especially in the telcos, um, are in the Blade and the Hyperscale chassis, where there was simply no room to plug in an extra PCI device. Uh, so people have been asking us for a while to develop a solution which would allow them uh, to um, use one of the LOM devices and achieve similar performance optimizations. Uh, so what we've selected um, is the Intel um, 82599. Uh, it's a relatively common chip that's available in uh, servers out there. Um, we haven't played with the updated Intel uh, chip. I'm sure it has similar capabilities. And sometime during this year, we'll enable them as well. Uh, but this work focused on a particular design for an OEM customer of ours, frankly. Uh, so it focused on the, uh, this particular chip. Um, the chip has a built-in uh, packet classifier that can support um, addition and removal of VLANs um, and has basic anti-spoofing capabilities. This is uh, just good enough to enable multi-tenancy. Uh, we did our changes um, uh, in, on the Juno, time, uh, on the Juno uh, and we'll be upstreaming them uh, in Liberty, hopefully if the community accepts the changes. Uh, the changes focused on getting the multi-tenant networks to work uh, and uh, getting uh, network multipath uh, to work in the VM. So uh, honestly, this is one of the areas that kind of been neglected. Most of the network devices out there have more than a single interface. Uh, they have two or three interfaces to enable uh, one interface to be the outbound, one inbound, or to enable the network HA. Uh, and uh, getting these mapped to physical interfaces has not been addressed before. So we decided to add that code to OpenStack. All right, so for the multi-tenant network, uh, uh, the NIC uh, virtual function uh, gets a MAC and a VLAN assigned. Uh, the VLAN will be removed on the incoming packets before being forwarded to the VM. Now, all of this is done by the hardware, right? There's no software switching involved. Uh, and uh, the VLAN is um, added to the outgoing packet, so fully preserving the ability to interoperate with um, OVS, uh, VLAN, uh, or other um, ML2 plugins. Um, the anti spoof is optional. Uh, we do have uh, a way to um, either turn it on or turn it off. Um, if it's on, uh, it will check both the VLAN and the MAC of the outgoing packet. Uh, but that means that you cannot do things like migrate the MAC from one SRV device to the other. And we needed to preserve that ability to um, allow for um, failover of the network interfaces. Uh, so optionally, we can uh, either turn on or uh, turn off uh, the anti-spoofing filter in the uh, Intel chip. Um, unfortunately, there is no firewall, right, because all of the capabilities are what's only in the chip. So there is no security group support. Um, you can enable security groups by controlling the ACLs uh, on the switch port fronting this device. So uh, we haven't done the work, but we know how to do it. We've done similar work in the past. Um, so um, the Juno code base actually mostly worked. It just needed a few tweaks uh, to the uh, XGBE driver in order to selectively enable or disable uh, the anti-spoofing filter. Um, OK, so the network multipath actually required a little bit more code. Um, so typically, like I mentioned before, the uh, physical devices uh, have multiple ports. Um, primarily use case is HA uh, or segregation of uh, networks. Um, uh, very few one-arm routers or one-arm load balancers exist. Most of them will be in the pass-through mode. We needed to model this uh, in the virtual world as well. So what we've done is we created a concept called device groups. Essentially, what we do is we allocate VFs from different PFs uh, and um, allow these to be assigned uh, to a single uh, guest. Uh, there are some updates uh, to the Nova scheduler. Um, I've, I've listed uh, the uh, proposed uh, changes. Now, they were done for Kilo. We're going to resubmit them for Liberty um, after we come back from the summit. Um, we, we do plan uh, with uh, the communities help to um, upstream the stuff in for liberty. Um, unfortunately, uh, multipath is supported, but you can't really enable uh, LACP. 
Multiple LACP groups on the same physical link runs into some limitations of the switches. So most switches out there won't support it. Uh, you may find an occasional switch that does, but most switches out there won't support it. So the failover modes are either Active Passive or Linux mods, Mode 6, uh, which plays few games. Uh, so no mode for LACP. Um, all right, so quick performance results. What we wanted to do, this is not an extensive performance study. What we wanted to do is we wanted to figure out if the work we've done uh, is more efficient than just using OVS. Uh, so we tested both the small packet performance um, and the large packet performance. And yes, yes, I know that MSS 64 is not a 64 byte packet. Thank you. Uh, already been pointed that out. Um, all right. So we got a 50% uh, throughput gain uh, on the small packet sizes uh, while using 40% less CPU. Now, we're using M1 medium, a single core instance, uh, so, uh, which means uh, essentially this test uh, is uh, largely uh, CPU bound uh, on the guest. Uh, if we went to a larger guest uh, or a much more impressive uh, test harness, which unfortunately we didn't have at the time we were preparing for this, uh, we would be able to get relatively close to wire speed on the small packets. Uh, for the normal packet sizes, um, uh, we got a four and a half uh, times improvement in throughput uh, versus OVS uh, with 35% CPU less used. Again, this is uh, largely uh, guest bound, so OVS will be able to deliver uh, in a single stream performance, roughly um, uh, 5 gigabits on a 10 gigabit interface, uh, but at utilizing significantly more CPU. Um, so we plan to rerun this test and uh, uh, publish a much more extensive uh, blog on um, how to use all of this stuff um, sometime uh, in the summer. Uh, all right. So I discussed uh, what we've done, but uh, obviously there's always alternatives uh, to the design. So uh, one of the more popular alternatives is a DPDPA-enabled virtual switch. Um, it addresses your need for more flexibility. So maybe VLANs are not enough. Maybe you need VXLAN uh, or uh, something else. Uh, you do need security groups uh, to enable true multi-tenancy. Uh, you possibly need to do other transformations, such as assigning diff serve tags or other things on a packet. So software switch is inherently more flexible, which is why software switch is the most popular option for virtualization out there. Um, so um, there is a couple of options in the DPDK. Uh, Intel DPDK, there is uh, two um, DPDK releases, I should say. There's a side branch uh, that Intel has maintained up to version 2. Um, and uh, now they're working on upstreaming the code in. Uh, we've tested their initial um, OBS upstreaming effort, and it does work. It works pretty well. And we're working to incorporating the DPDK-enabled OBS um, into the Mirantis release sometime towards the end of the year. Um, so currently, the security groups are still not enabled um, in the Intel version um, that's uh, in the mainline of the OBS branch. Uh, but Intel is working on it, um, so that should be available by the end of the year. Um, now, in addition to the Intel's DPDK, which is available if you just grab the uh, latest OVS, you have Sixwind. Uh, it's a company that ships a commercial-based OVS uh, with DPDK support, and they have a fairly good uh, uh, performance benchmarks that they've released. Um, so there is um, other options out there available. If you need something now and you're not willing to wait um, until uh, the community bits for the OVS get stabilized. Uh, so quick comparison, when would you use one versus the other? Uh, DPDK will impose a higher CPU load. Uh, it'll potentially comp uh, consume multiple cores just to process one or two 10 gigabit interfaces. Um, you have a, a relatively higher degree of hardware independence. You still need a DPDK driver um, on your uh, Linux, uh, but lots and lots of network cards are supported, certainly more than with our SRV approach. Um, and then uh, you have a greater flexibility um, uh, to use VXLAN, 
to apply div serve to do other packet manipulations. It will impose a bit more latency, not much, but a bit more latency will be imposed because there is some context switching involved uh, in order to get the packet through the system. Um, and it's typically going to be used um, as a backend uh, data center in the telco use case or uh, in the enterprise NFE use case where the key uh, success criteria is uh, flexibility. Uh, SRV will have a significantly lower CPU um, overhead. Um, it will have low latency. You're essentially talking to the PCI device directly from your VM. Um, it is hardware specific. So we got, uh, we obviously, Mellanox has been incorporated in Fuel. Now uh, the Intel 8259 support will be available uh, in, uh, in MOS and then uh, shortly in Fuel. Uh, but um, it is hardware specific, so you need to develop the work on the specific drivers. Now, we talked to uh, QLogic, who so now seems to own the Broadcom chipset. Their chip seems to have similar capabilities. We just haven't gotten around to uh, playing with it enough to get it to work. So eventually, we'll get the Broadcom slash QLogic chip to work as well. Uh, and we'll go look at the latest Intel 40 and others uh, to make sure that we can uh, get them to work um, in this fashion. Now, some of the latest uh, 40s claim to have also the VXLAN offload, so maybe we'll even get a VXLAN encapsulation working in addition to VLAN. Um, so the, but the typical use case for this um, SRV um, is uh, when you want to build these small pop clouds, where you have a small, uh, relatively tightly managed cluster where the additional CPU load um, of the DPDK approach is simply not acceptable. Uh, all right, so possible future extensions. Uh, well, we thought about it, uh, about how we'd combine it with a larger universe. And one of the most obvious use cases would be to combine this uh, with ACI, which will allow you to do VLAN to VXLAN. And then all of a sudden, now you can run this in your big backend cloud. Uh, so pretty cool. We haven't tested the bits yet, uh, but uh, we plan on doing so. Uh, obviously, uh, Cisco ACI is not the only uh, SDN that can uh, provide you the big cloud expansion story. So you can use it with the big switch open flow-based forwarding as well. Um, and it should be possible to, you, to extend um, either the Cumulus or the Rista plugins to provide the similar uh, v v VLAN to VXLAN transformations uh, to um, allow for, for this to run on um, L3 data center fabrics. All right, um, so that's pretty much on the presentation. Uh, the uh, links um, are available. Um, I'll uh, post the presentation out on the Miranta site. So you don't need to sit here and take the snapshots, but um, I'm welcome any questions you may have. Going once, twice. All right, everybody understands everything. All right. Uh, if you have any follow-up questions, uh, feel free to contact me. Thank you.